this is a play of, uh, called 10 Days on Earth. Uh, and this old character actually walks down the stairs at the beginning of the play, walks back across the stage, takes off her slippers, and goes to bed to die. And the rest of the play is about her middle-aged, uh, intellectually challenged son not knowing she's dead. So the whole premise of the play was, if you were alone but you didn't know it, would you be lonely? Um, and it was so cool to see a marionette on 92-inch strings take her slippers off. I always love that little gasp when, uh, just by the pull of a string and two cheap magnets, the audience goes, how do you do that? So, <laughs> oh, next please, Jack. There she is as a young woman with her baby. This is uh, God, Lloyd God, uh, a crazy street guy who says he's God, or is he God? And there's the adult son, Daryl. Uh, he retreats to a fantasy world of his favorite children's book, so that came to life during that play. So here we have the adventures of Honey Dog and Little Burke, Burp when they meet Blanche Duba, the, the sheep. Uh, this is from the current show. Uh, uh, it's about a middle-aged puppeteer who's going to kill himself. <laughs> Complete invention. Um, he's a cruise ship puppeteer, and he gets fired for shushing someone in the audience. So he stands on the edge of a ship about to kill himself and jump off when his dead mentor, Sid Diamond, appears to him as a hand puppet and wrestles him to the ground. It's pretty funny. They quote Shakespeare while fighting. And then he is forced to relive his life backwards as a marionette show so he can go back to the thing that he was initially passionate about. So here we have Billy Twinkle's four cabaret acts. We have Biddy Bant and Brewster, who um, gets drunk on stage, her drink disappears, um, and she sings an aria. That old man uh, actually has a balloon under his hospital gown that inflates when he sees the audience. Um, <laughs> We have the roller skating bear, which every puppeteer has to do. And then we have a stripper who actually takes off five layers of clothing, courtesy of four strings, three snaps, and a safety pin. Um, and there's, in this show, we also have marionettes working miniature marionettes. So here's Billy at 15 in Moose Jaw at the Wagon Wheel Motor Lodge doing his club act um, in rumbus leaves, which he bought from the Moose Jaw Skating Club. Uh, <laughs> And there we have more puppets working. And there's Billy, middle-aged, when he gets fat uh, with his mentor. And there's the show image for that. So that's the kind of stuff I built. God, I have 10 minutes left. OK. What I really wanted to tell you, other than show you that, which was kind of a secondary, um, I told you that story about the sale tag, because that was one of my dad's favorite stories I would tell about myself. And my dad loved me telling all of these awkward stories that I'd um, gotten myself into. Someday, if I'm ever invited back, I'll tell you the story about the TV producer with the giant mole. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that was actually my dad's favorite story about me. And he would get that laughter going where he would jiggle, turn red, be silent, start choking. And I, that was my happiest moment with my dad, is when he would start choking. My mother was an easy mark, because all she would do was start peeing. So that was really no fun. Um, so I'm telling you that because last year, in, when I was building, building Billy Twinkle, Requiem for a Golden Boy, I was, for the flashbacks, we see his father. And the day I was making the mold for Billy's dad's head, I got a call that my dad had died. So I go home. And the minute I'm off the plane, my mother announces that I'm giving his eulogy. Now, honestly, I love standing on a stage. I love standing on a stage every night with a script that I know backwards, with something I've rehearsed, with things I've made. That's my favorite adventure in life, standing under these lights of heaven, as I call them. I don't even mind doing this, and I do more of this stuff. I mean, in the puppetry world, I'm sort of the Tony Robbins of puppetry. So if you ever want a pep rally about marionettes, I'm your guy. Um, <laughs> But a eulogy for your father is a whole other thing, because my dad was a really beloved, popular guy in our town. And my dad was a volunteer, in, and he had two jobs after he retired, and he did community outreach, and he was a sports guy, and everyone he ever worked with loved him, and he was highly influential. One of those guys, one of the service clubs told me that, you know, with his death, they would have to find three people in the Kiwanis Club to replace just him in terms of volunteer work. So I knew we were going to have a full house. I knew a lot of people were coming. And I didn't know how to eulogize this man to a diverse group of people and still make it personal and honor him. And then I 
worked on this for three days, and the night before the funeral, it hit me of what my favorite thing about my dad was, and it was something that was so embarrassing that had mortified me for years. You see, my dad, at any given opportunity in December, would dress up as Santa Claus. And he had this weird Santa Claus costume fetish, I think. One year, I, in, my, in my late 20s, I used this, uh, this weirdness of his for my own evil gain because uh, there was always a slumber party with a group of friends of us. Uh, and we would have a Christmas party and we would sleep uh, over and we would have breakfast in the morning. So I had my dad show up as Santa Claus and I had told him dirt on everyone at this party. And we were all cynical young adults in our new pajamas and then as the doorbell rang, I heard a ho, ho, ho and the hostess screamed and inbounded the most authentic Santa Claus you would ever see and everyone sat on his lap and he had dirt on it everybody. And you know, I remember my friend Diane saying that she'd been a very good girl, and he said, then why are you dating a married man? And the look on her face <laughs> was stunning. But he still gave her a present, which really screwed her up. And I had to go sit, I had to go sit on Santa's lap, and this is weird, I had to give him dirt about me, so that's like telling on yourself to Santa who's your dad. But anyway, in order to not blow our cover, that's what I did. So he left, and the snow was falling, and it was crazy cartoon snowflakes, and he went to his getaway car, which was my mother around the corner, and off they went. And to this day, that is the favorite Christmas memory of everyone in that house. So I told people that I was actually the son of Santa Claus, and in my eulogy, I promised last March, or a year ago March, that I, come December, his son would take over the family business, get a Santa Claus suit, a wig and a beard, and show up unannounced at the homes of people with children who still believe in Santa Claus. So. That went over pretty good until December when I was in a hotel room in Ottawa and the snow was falling outside and I thought, oh crap, I publicly announced that I was going to be Santa Claus. And wouldn't you know what, that day my mother called and said, so how's it going with the Santa preparations? <laughs> so I did what anyone in a hotel room would do. No, not that. <laughs> I'd already done that. Uh, <laughs> twice, but anyway. <laughs> But it was noon and time to get to work, so. <laughs> You're dirty. Uh, I went online and looked at Santa Claus suits, and they were really expensive and really crappy, and they weren't like my dad's at all. So long story short, I borrowed one from a theater here, because like most theaters, they've closed the wardrobes across the country, so they don't actually know I borrowed their state-of-the-art Santa suit with a, with a tummy and a beard and a wig. And I thought, I'm gonna show up at all these households where I have you know, my goddaughter and, and other kids. And then I realized, in Toronto, you cannot show up on Christmas Eve as Santa. That has home invasion written all over it. <laughs> So I had to let these parents know, are you home Christmas Eve? I'd like to drop by, don't overdo it, because we know how parents are today. They prep everything. I'm like, just be chill, just be cool, don't make a fuss. So I got a driver who wore an elf hat, there's not many people I know who have a car who are free on Christmas Eve and you can smoke in their car. Trust me, that was the biggest part of the job. Um, and I had a getaway elf in the back of the car and we showed up. And you know, I thought I was doing something really cool for my dad and honoring a public thing. And I think, you know, we all have our own image of ourselves. And I went, this is going to be a stretch playing Santa Claus. But the minute I put on that wig and that beard, I thought, oh, fuck, now I know I have these eyes and this nose. Because Jack's going to show you. There's Santa Claus. <laughs> and here's another one. And I have to tell you guys, this is, this is my idea for you this year. This is not um, maybe political. This is not maybe deep. This isn't maybe the, um, the thing I would have written. But I, I wanted to take Moses at his word and really tell you something off the cuff that was important this year. And I will tell you of all the things I've done, and I've had a really good run at it. I've been beautifully mentored, I've been beautifully parented, I've uh, had great colleagues and friends, and I've played the theaters I never thought I would play around the world, and I get to do my work. So I have a charmed, beautiful life. And I thought I'd figured everything out. I make the world small, I shrink it, and I get to manipulate it and understand it. But, I get why my dad had the Santa Claus suit fetish now. Because in that night, December 24th, showing up 
these little kids didn't talk to me about stuff. They didn't talk to me about what they'd asked me for or what they were expecting, which shocked me. They just went, cool, Santa's here, took my hand and showed me stuff and talked to me. And their willingness to believe in a magical being was something I haven't seen in a long, long time, if ever. So what I learned this year is by making myself ridiculous, taking a risk, doing something maybe I didn't want to do that wasn't about me, I achieved a state of grace on this planet that I have honestly never known. And it was doing exactly that. Now, you don't have to do that. Maybe you don't even believe in Santa Claus or Christmas, but you could be a bunny or a bear or an egg, whatever. <laughs> But I am telling you, groovy people at Idea City, whose minds are full of big ideas right now, my challenge is to say, why don't you think of something absolutely ridiculous and small in your own life that you could do like that? Because I will tell you, I have never known that kind of joy, and I thought I knew what joy was. So here is my idea for you today, and it's three words. And you can use this mantra on public transit. You can use this in the grocery store. You can use this when you're in line at a bank. You can use it when you're waiting for someone who's late. You can use it when you're falling asleep at night. And it works really the best, really the best, if you do it first thing in the morning before you get out of bed. Because it actually will change you. So here's my idea for you today, my three words. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> so bring him back. Bring him back. <laughs> bring him back. <laughs> <laughs> but Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie. Here's my, here's my thinking. What is a robot except a puppet brought to life? It's all puppetry, I right. think. Now, the people who are going to speak to us in the remaining part of the section are going to speak about bringing it to life by virtue of technology. You've been bringing them to life by yourself. Wood, wire, they get personality, they get soul. You give them a voice. I think you're the greatest roboticist around. <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, among all the people who receive standing ovations here over the course of our now 10th year, I think Ronnie got one of the longest. Ronnie, thank you so much. Thanks.